Who are you? Uh, we're here at the Hoboken Historical Museum in the Upper Gallery, and we're streaming out live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You know that because that's how you're joining us right now. And of course, this program will be archived on our YouTube channel, and we hope you spread the word uh, to others to check it out. Uh, again, the show is Hoboken Talks, and this is Thursday night, 7 p.m. live. And uh, this, we believe, is around our 25th show. We are a museum. We should have our historical facts correct. So we're not sure if it's 24, 25, <laughs> or 26, but we'll say circa our 25th show. And again, every Thursday. Uh, past interviews have been with Liz Cohen, Issa Sow, Bill Miller, Greg Dale Aquila, you name it, we did it. And if we haven't done someone you think we should be interviewing, please reach out and give us some names. Uh, my name is Bob Foster. I'm the director of the museum and uh, from time to time and the host for Hoboken Talks. And tonight we are so fortunate and timely to have Father Vincent Fortunato. Did I get that right? You Fortunato? You okay. Got it. Who says... Welcome, Father Vinny. Uh, uh, we've really just met recently, but you're a very warm person. I and you said we could call you Father Vinny, so that that tells me a lot. Thank so you. welcome to the show. Great to be here. Um, so I'm just letting people know that uh, if you want to make comments, ask a question to Father Vinny. Uh, uh, you know, just give a shout out that you're listening. We'd love to see you. Uh, text on the screen and we will recognize you. If there's a question, we'll try to answer it. And uh, it makes being live more relevant, I would say. And uh, we, uh, we are so, again, happy that you're here. And we'll just get right into it. Uh, tell us what your job is. Well, at St. Anne's Church, I am the parochial vicar, which means there's a pastor and then there's Father Charles and myself who assist in the parish there. So Father Remo is the pastor, and then Father Charles and I assist uh, just to kind of keep things mo moving, flow flowing nicely. That's sure, right. sure. Um, uh, around how many parishioners do you have? You know, that well, I, I'm, I'm going to say, because that can shift. It, it shifts with a lot of people moving out from COVID and a lot more people moving in. Uh, so I'm going to say between seven and 800 families or units. So we say more units because you have a lot of single people sure, in the parish. Sure. In the past, was a lot of families. Right. And one of the reasons we invited you on the program at this time is that we're right on the cusp of, of the St. Anne's Feast. Uh, and we were talking on the way over how many, how many years, what year are we celebrating? Well, it's the 111th year this year, um, minus last year as far as the feast goes. So we're trying to figure out, did we count it or didn't we? But there's two parts to this. There's the feast, which is what a lot of people know. But more importantly, there's the novena. And the novena is nine nights before the feast. There's mass each night. And last year we had that. We had that part of it. Uh, on the day of the feast, we had a big mass, but then we just left the church open. Normally we process with the statue, with the, the saint. And um, we didn't do that last year. We just left the church open all day so people can come in. We did not have a street festival last year. Right. So I'm going to say it's 111th year of which 110 of those there's been a street festival. So that means like the St. Anne's Church that people would visit now at 7th and Jefferson uh, was built in, we were just talking about that, 1926. So the feast goes back longer, and the novena Before, goes back older than the present building. Right, because the present, Cornerstone is 1925. Was that completed in 25 or 26? I don't know. I think it was completed more in 26. But, uh, you know, before that, there was a smaller church, and uh, it, it was, it was uh, the parish was there. Being, you know, the church is one part of it, but the parish family has been there for 100, 
and I, I don't. I'm going to say 111 years. Right, right. That makes sense. <clears throat> um, and then tell us who Saint Anne is. Well, Saint Anne is the mother of the Blessed Mother, which would be the grandmother of Jesus. And so it becomes a, a she's a big patron then. First of all, for grandmothers. Secondly, for women expecting children or wanting to have children. And uh, so it's really become, that's, that's one of the things I think that really is established in that parish. Because the St. Anne statue is the same statue from 111 years ago. And every year for, for the procession, they put a, a cape on her that has people have given, donated over these 111 years, things to St. Anne, you know, to, the, to, that, to that cape of which there might be watches, wedding rings, whatever, in gratitude for answered prayers. So many of the women maybe who have conceived the child after praying to St. Anne, uh, they would put something on that, that cape. That tradition still continues. People are still bringing things to put on that cape. Um, when you see the procession, which is the last day of the feast? July 26th, right. yes. That's the um, Feast of St. Anne. Right, and so tell us what happens on that day. Well, it starts out with a big mass, and uh, the procession has is the procession begins with St. Anne's Guild. They're the ones, this, this is their 80th anniversary. And the St. Anne's Guild is a woman's guild long tradition in this and they're the ones who really uh carry carry the saint literally uh, yeah well yes in, until uh it's 2012 when we got a, a cart to put her on because they the aging of the people are preventing from a, able to carry it all through the streets for the five hours that they do and uh, so that's the mass and then the procession and only women can carry the saint. That tradition is 111 years right. old and uh, so it's changed if, a bit. If I say Saint Anne is the patron saint of women, is that correct? Or uh, I wouldn't say that. I would say just patron saint of grandmothers, of mothers, because of her role as the mother of the Blessed Mother and the grandmother of Jesus. That's what the focus there is. And so the guild, how does that operate? Well, it's uh, like any other guild. They, they meet monthly. Um, they do a number of fundraisers throughout the year. Uh, very, very supportive in the parish. And, and they, they raise a lot of money through uh, tricky trays, through St. Joseph table. And they run the Zapla booth. The Zaplas are the fried dough uh with a uh, little powdered sugar on it simple but that's a huge huge support to the parish because right. it, it does bring a, a lot of money in and sure people wait online right for the Zapples. whenever i've been to the feast uh the museum usually sets up a booth for the week yeah, right. which is kind of a commitment on our part but obviously just a blip compared mm -hmm. to you know the torch you guys are carrying but the most common conversation that you overhear is how long is the Zeppeli line <laughs> okay and like oh the line wasn't too bad or or i waited 20 minutes and, right and you see the powdered sugar on their face and <laughs> you know they've been there and, and and you know last year when we didn't have the feast so we didn't have the Zeppeli booth People want to know, are we still going to have the Zapla booth, even though COVID was there? So said, no, we can't. And they were trying to figure out a way we could do that. Could we have drive-bys? And, and we said, it's, it's just not worth it. Right, right, drive -by. And so um, what prompted you to do the feast, to bring it back? The, this year? Or this mean? year. Or did you... Number one, tradition. Mm -hmm. Tradition is a key key component to this whole thing. Um, because we missed it last year, we the parishioners and the people who really volunteer for this, they were ready to go again. And we weren't sure, like anybody else, we didn't know what the, 
the restrictions would be lifted <clears throat> back in the beginning of June. Uh, Father Remo and Mario Ferrara, who is the chairperson, met with the police department, some of the city council, and they were very supportive and said, go with it. And of course, June, July, that's two months. You're not going to get uh, some of the, the traditions that we've had, you know, or some of the things that we put into it. And uh, it's, it's a feast that started, believe it or not, wasn't so big, even though you see thousands of people. Um, the streets weren't closed as much as they are now. Um, a lot goes back to Marie Chatara a number of years ago. Marie has passed away this past year, last year. Big, big loss. Uh, huge, huge. And Marie was involved with this, I, I don't even know how many years, just as a young woman is a part of the guild. And she added a big dimension of bringing more vendors in. So that made the feast very big on the streets. You know? Right. So I, she, I can remember that she would call you on the phone like January 2nd, mm -hmm. you know, like it's a new year. Let's get it going for July. You know, most right. people don't deal with that long. Right. Time. And that's yeah. Marie and Mario, both of them will work. They would normally start every week, every Friday night. They would meet in January to start planning because you have to, you know, usually we would have bands, live bands. This year, there will not be any live bands, right. only because the contracts have to be done sure. long before June. Right. And uh, so but you said you would have a DJ and there will be there'll a be a DJ. Yes, element. there'll be a DJ every night. Right. You know, and, right. Uh, sure. So. And um, just, you know, so we really encourage people to go to the feast. It's a real yeah. Hoboken tradition. We kind of say if you're new to town, you know, you want to get out and explore. It's mm -hmm. hot, and there's no better place uh, yeah. than going to the feast. Yeah. And you'll meet your neighbors, and you'll make new yeah. friends. And I always say, make sure you go in and visit the church. Yeah, people forget that that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. And that's the primary thing for us is, uh, like they say, the novena. That's why last year we had the novena anyway, and we had the big mass on the feast day. Um, and and that that's why you know people say, well, is it good to do it in the streets there? Because of the dedication of the women in the guild and the people in the parish, it's part of the spiritual religious part. So the spiritual religious is first that filters out into the street. If we couldn't do it there and had to do it someplace else, it breaks that up and it, it prevents from us. It prevents us from really keeping that tradition alive right. between the, the, the prayer and the, the social part of it. Sure. Location, location, location. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so you served in other communities? Yes. I, uh, I, I actually, the only place, I'm a priest 40, let me see, 41 years. Wow. The only place I've ever really functioned in a parish is Hoboken, St. Anne's. All the other time I did other types of things. I did formation work, which is training the guys who are coming in. I've done, I've done preaching. I was pastor from 2009 to 2012, and then I was asked to go preaching. So I did preach for eight years. And then Father Remo asked me to come back to help uh, take up some of the load because Father Remo's pastor, and he's provincial, which means he's in charge of all the friars, and it's a huge responsibility. So... But Father Charlie and I try to kind of take some of the stuff off his plate. And before we were talking, you said your background was that you had grown up on Long Island. Yes. Which is kind of the suburbia of the USA, or at least yes. the East Coast. Yes. I see it that way. We have that in common. Yes. And um, but, Lived in the same town for a while. That's right. That's right. Um, but uh, what makes Hoboken, like what? What did you find when you first came to Hoboken? Well, the first feast I ever came to was two, the year 2000 that I really, you know, got into it. I was provincial at that time. I was living in Union City. And uh, I did not grow up with this kind of tradition. We didn't have processions. We didn't have street festivals. And so... <laughs> It was a unique experience for me when I'm seeing 
all this uh, this devotion. And I remember the the bishop was Bishop Siratelli. He was an auxiliary here, and then went on to Patterson. And he was the uh, the presider, the, the main celebrant of the liturgy. <laughs> he grew up in Newark. And I remember standing next to him as the the saint is coming out, because you call her a saint. You don't call her a statue. I didn't know that. I got corrected a few times. It, as the saint came out of the church, I noticed so many of these women in the guild and just women in the streets crying, tears coming. And it was funny because I said to Bishop Siratelli, I said, look at these people, they're crying. And he said, I can't see them through the tears in my eyes. He says, I grew up with this. And that's when I realized, okay, I'm the odd man out. <laughs> you know, there's a huge devotion here that uh, these people, it's the tradition of devotion is huge in the Catholic faith. And it's huge because it speaks beyond just words. It's a deeper place. It's a place in people's hearts. And, uh, and, the, and the St. Anne's Guild carries a lot of tradition. Many of the women, their mothers were in it, their grandmothers were in it, the great-grandmothers were in it, and it's like a tradition carried on. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful tradition. And uh, can you talk about some of uh, the parishioners that are a bit unique? Uh, I can. I, I, I can. I'll talk about, uh, of course, Marie Tatara, God rest her soul, was, was unique and, and a wonderful lady. Very, very, very devotional. Um, I, I could talk about an old timer, Joe Sivo. Joe Sivo is uh, an usher at church. And when I would go around the country preaching and talking about, uh, you know, mass and talks on the mass or talking about different ministries, I would always use Josevo as an example of what a good minister is. And he's an usher, which means he doesn't just see people. He looks for people that are new, people that uh, th this is a new face. And inevitably, he will go up to those people and uh, ask them who they are. Are they new here? If they're there after Mass and they want to know about the church, he'll take them around. He'll show them different things. And that's what, you know, you don't find that in too many places, you know, where he is that loyal of a, of a parishioner and proud of his church, proud of his church. And, you know, if it's... After the 9 o'clock mass, he'll take them down to the San Giacomo Club for breakfast, <laughs> you know, or go someplace for coffee. Because, right. uh, and, uh, you know, so you have parishioners like that. Uh, Joe, Joe Trulio. Joe Trulio, a strong tradition in the parish. Joe is very faithful. Um, many of the, Patty Pasculi, um, <clears throat> some of the women, many of the women uh, have been involved there. Ann Sheeran. Ann Sheeran's a, uh, a real sweetheart and a, a real person that, that you know, th this is their life. This is their blood blood flow, you know, and not just for St. Anne's, but all through the year, right. all through the year. And So how are you finding the younger audience, uh, like new parishioners? Well, I, and that's interesting to say because uh, – I just was talking to four different parishioners in the past couple of days who are volunteering. So a lot of the young parishioners are volunteering to help with the feast. They're excited about it. And that's part of it. You know, it's not just, it's not a, an event for us to bring money in, which is, it, it is. But more importantly, it's an event where people meet each other. Uh, people, a lot of the young people want to work in the bar. And it's great because uh, they're, they're connecting with their friends there. Uh, you have young people all over the place there. So uh, there's a big mix between the young and the born and raised, the people who have been there all their life. Uh, and and you, you need both. Yes. And the, and the young people are coming to church. You know, people who think young people don't go to church, they do. You know, uh, we have a number of weddings this year. We have over 40, 45 weddings this year. I think 
I don't know, we, I don't know what we have for 2022, but we're probably up to about 20 to 30, you know, sure. which is a sign that people are around, people are coming, people want this. And then uh, tell us a little bit how you've been operating during uh, COVID uh, using technology, I assume. Yeah. Uh, when COVID first hit, because we had to close everything, you know, we couldn't have anything going on. No people can come to church. And it's another classic example of St. Anne's. We had three different people that came forward who do camera work, asking if we needed any help. And, you know, one man... Uh, and, and Nathan, he he and his wife, they're there every Sunday, and they they came. He br brings his camera in. He does everything, live streams it, um, and that that is not only when he can't make it. We have other people that use his camera and mm -hmm. and continue to do it. So uh, th the live stream has been the key because I think that opened up all kinds of new possibilities, you know, I mean, everybody's been, uh, you know, zooming and, and that. And so the religious ed program had a zoom, uh, adult education, zoom, uh, write a Christian, Christian initiation for adults zoomed. So it pushed us to that new technology. Um, <laughs> otherwise we'd probably be sitting around doing nothing with that. Right. Um, <clears throat> and it, you know, and for 2020, 21, uh, who ever thought the technology would be this way? Who ever right. thought we'd be doing something like this? Sure. You know, um, I mean, I just thought about it. But I, I, I think it's okay to ask. What about confession? Yeah, that <laughs> that still goes. You know, um, for a while, a long while, we couldn't use the confessional, so we used two rooms uh, on a Saturday when people started coming back. Uh, so we were shut down. I'm trying to think. Probably from a year ago, April to June. Yeah. And it started opening up a little. And so we would have confessions. What we did at that time, too, was even though the church was closed for mass, we were allowed to open it a couple hours a day. And so during those couple of hours, one of us, usually Father Charlie, he's very good at this, uh, sitting here in confessions, you know, he's he just there. Do you want to go? He's off to the side, and, and you can go. So, right. uh, and now we're pretty much back to normal. You know, right. in and so, do you give mass yourself? Yes. Yeah. And but I see you as a real people person, so it must have been a little challenging, uh, having, you know, <laughs> just seeing the reaction of people, you know, not seeing the reaction of people, sure. and the aftermath after uh, a mass. You yeah, know, you kind of connect with people, and and that could must have been yeah. kind of hard. And saying mass in an empty church, you know, and Father Remo, to his credit, said, "We just say we just do what we're doing as if the full church." And so it wasn't putting any show on or anything else. It was we're doing this, and there's a camera watching us, but we are still saying the mass, and sure. it really was. Uh, it, it it became it's a natural thing. It wasn't really, you know, we weren't performing for the camera, right? And uh, and he brought in you know Jeremy and Rebecca, who are the musicians, right from the beginning. So it was an empty church, but they were singing and mm -hmm. playing, and uh, so it was. If you're watching it at home, it felt like it's just like every other mass, you right? Know? Right. Interesting. Uh, we've been having a great conversation, but we do have all these pictures, too. Maybe we'll uh, roll some pictures. Uh, and I want to thank Rand Hoppe, who is our engineer and producer of the program. And he's moving the images and making us look good. Yeah. So uh, we're looking at some historic pictures that are in the museum's collection. By the way, you have great pictures in the museum. And, great uh, pictures. Yep. And these are accessible by going on our website, hobokenmuseum.org, and it's a searchable database. So you could mm. go on, it's all free, type in St. Anne, and bam, these would yeah. come up as thumbnails. So this does not look like the church where no, you work. <laughs> that's the old church. It's the old church. And I, I believe it was moved to the back 
when they started to build the new church. Right. And I think that the old church ended up, I think, is almost like a CYO gym or place uh -huh. and burnt down. Right. That's right. I heard that. So that church, we believe, was at 7th and Jefferson, the site mm -hmm. of where uh, the church is now, but it's a wood frame structure, I believe. No wonder it burned down. <laughs> and like most wood structures in Hoboken, they eventually burned down. And look at that flagpole. It's so interesting. And it looks like you know a, it's a bell tower. It, between uh, in that window, that, that symbol there. Yes. That's still... That's somewhere. Okay. In kind of that gothic I just noticed style. it now. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I wonder if they uh, kept that. Right. And, yeah, church architecture is really interesting and, mm. you know, goes back to medieval times, a lot of it. Okay. And we're moving on. Aha. Uh -huh. It's a little hard to read this because we got foreground and background, but what do you think we're looking at? Well, that's the construction of the new church. Right. Wow. And looks like it's not going to burn down. You got no. steel there, you know, steel yeah. girders and brick. Brick, yeah. And in the background is the old St. Anne's that's wow. been moved over to Madison Street. Right. And that would be there. the back in the back parking lot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. The back parking lot. I always <clears> wondered <throat> why you had such a, why you're lucky to have such a big uh, parking lot there. That's always a problem for a lot of churches. Yeah. There's no place to park. And it's a great shot of all the workmen posing. And that's sort of a uh, almost like airbrushed of the day. Ah, uh, yes. And you see and, the emblem on the top? Yeah. It's the that's same. an enlarged emblem of the one that was in the old church. Right, right. I, I just noticed that. Sure. I don't know enough about church architecture, but I'm sure it's, you know, could be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or who knows? <laughs> yeah. You know, Trinity. Pretty cool. And uh, I like that shot. And uh, kind of noticing some of the photographer's marks in the corners. That's the Rossi Studio, 415 Jefferson Street. And he's, you know, big in the Italian mm -hmm. community. And that shot is, uh, what do you think? I mean, could be the grand opening of the be. celebration of it the church. Could be. Uh, but they're... Or, yeah, or the arrival of the statue, something big, yeah. something big. They got the ribbons on and so on. And that's a little similar to the backdrop that we have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is by also Rossi Studio. And you can see uh, the parish house to the right. Yep. And the old church and the old the church is still there. And uh, I guess the statue is coming be, out. I yeah. said the statue. St. Well, Anne yes. is coming out. Yes. And uh, it, it's, well, it could be going back in. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, you're right. You're right. Only because the it looks like. The crowd is kind of small, too. Uh, yeah. And they look like they, they just finished. But no, yeah. You're, there's they're, all men. The, That's the other interesting piece. Yeah. Well, <laughs> And then the flags are kind of lowered, like they're going in. Now, now it's coming out. Now, right. now you have that's a, right. We that's have, we a have big a crowd. reverse, and that's our background too. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot of folks. Wow. I always think of uh, the procession being on the hottest day of summer, <laughs> and that when it's not, I just think, oh, how lucky they are. And say, God you, bless you, those women too, because yeah. they don't really care. Right. If it's hot, if it's raining. I was with them one time. I walked with it. The only time I really ever walked the whole route right. was in the rain, and it rained a whole time. Wow. And they they just stuck with it. Uh, yeah, there's some old timers. There. Yeah, some, someday we're going to have to look in your archives yeah. and try to find out these names. But I believe they are some of the original folks who came yes. over from I Italy think, to help think, establish the yes. church. The guy, the third guy from the left, the really long beard there, he is probably one of the founding friars of uh, our province coming from Italy. Our right. province came from Tuscany, and uh, they established in, in the Bronx. Actually, in, in Patterson was the first place. And then the Bronx, and then Hoboken was the oh, next. Interesting. So, uh, and can you talk a little bit about the Italian background of a lot of the parishioners, uh, their original 
I, I my, my thinking is that they are from uh, San Giacomo, the, the San Giacomo Club. Uh, I, and I don't exactly know where that is in Italy, but that's where I think a lot of the tradition came from. Uh, in fact, in the procession, they they will take the statue of St. James, St. Giacomo, St. James, right. and they'll process, uh, they'll come in, Father Michael Gorey, the first pastor. Thanks, Roseanne. Oh, there's Roseanne Versace. Yes. She's doing a great job. Mm -hmm. She is a yeah. key person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's pretty much taken over from Marie to Tara, Right. So. Sure. Hi, Roseanne. <laughs> yeah. she Father knew. Gorey. That's who okay. it is. Okay. Wow. And uh, so we'd love to have Marie on sometime. And also Joe Sebo. I think he'd be oh, an interesting yeah. guest. Okay. We're moving on. Oh, yeah, this one I just thought mm. we'd put in. Uh, this is what they would call the St. Anne's Bazaar, which was kind of like a, a carnival event, I think, associated with the feast, but it was sort wow. of honoring young, you know, congregants. Mm -hmm. uh, and I happen to know the gentleman on the right of the screen is Jimmy Roselli. Wow, who was a pretty famous Neapolitan yes. singer, and you said you and did. He, uh, he and he, when he died, I did his funeral at St. Anne's. Right, and then a number of years later, I was given a parish mission in Florida, and I met his wife there. Oh yeah, so, she she's been here. Yeah, yeah his wife. Yeah, yeah, because he was a parishioner. Okay, right from the beginning. Right, right, and to his Jimmy Roselli's right is beat. Is B. Teresa, who was the member of the church, but it would have preceded mm -hmm. you. And uh, they actually, the Teresas lived in the old parish house. Really? Uh, like a couple doors down, there was mm -hmm. a uh, wood frame house that was set back. And that happened to be the old parish house. Mm. Okay, we're moving. Ah, I like this shot. Now, this is a great picture because it's still what they're doing. The, the women. Walk with the statue with the saint, and if you notice the woman in the black dress, she's barefoot. Yeah, that was a tradition that a lot of uh, only women can walk the statue or would carry it. And uh, now what they have, they have uh, uh, on the cart, uh, but it, it they could walk with it. But uh, only the women and the women, many of the women would would walk barefoot. That was the tradition. So are there actually like teams in, within the guild, like six women who carry the statue and then there's another team? Or? They, th at the beginning, yes, at the beginning. But as the, as the saint starts to go through the streets, it goes for five hours. Yeah. And as it starts to go through the streets, the crowd thins out. Right. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we decided to go with a cart. Right. Uh, uh, was that a little controversial within the guild? Or? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You don't have to elaborate. But. Very controversial, right. and it it still is a bit. And I understand it. You know, uh, many of the women saw the tradition that that tradition was taken away, and I I, I have to take the credit here. I'm the one who made that decision to put it on the cart, and. Uh, it, it 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 was a decision I went back and forth on, and I didn't actually decide it totally until the day before that the 2012 procession. And uh, uh, yes, because some of them, it is a very very important thing to carry, very important. The positives: some of the women who've gotten older, or some of the women who are handicapped, cannot carry, but now they can at least walk with. The, the saint, right, right. Um, I can I can see the positives and negatives. Yeah. But, uh, anytime there's a change, you know, change it's going to be it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Right. Anytime. Oh, yeah. I love that photo too. It really says that. And uh, so these are more contemporary shots, mm -hmm. and that we're seeing more of the garment or the vest. Right. Of, yes. The uh, the the cape there. And as you could see that, that's St. Anne, and that's the Blessed Mother as a child. So that's why that's, that's you'll always see the Blessed Mother with St. Anne. 
uh, you know, the whole thing of that, that this is the mother of, of blessed mother and grandmother of Jesus. And um, so, and the floral wreath, I guess, is that uh, have significance? Or, uh, or just, just I, I, you know what? If I'm wrong, someone should let me know. But I think it, it's, I don't know if it's a significant thing, but it is something of, they change the flowers every day. Oh, wow. And they, they do change the, the, uh, the flower. The flowers around the, the, the and they give that to, to somebody uh, whose mass it was for that day. Right. And uh, is there a, a particular florist that does that, or is there, there is? And Anne Marie Rizzo was another great one to check. She's the one who uh, takes care of that with the florist, and I'm not sure who the florist is, and that's terrible. Uh, no, it's okay. Roseanne, you could tell me that uh, <laughs> again if you wanted to. Um, and uh, so this this Saint Anne is in the church throughout the year. In the back of the church, she has her own chapel. As you walk into the church, you go to the right, and there's the chapel for Saint Anne, and uh, so she's there. And this statue is the original statue that has been. Uh, refurbished hugely it was ellen stewart beautiful okay thanks ellen so um it, we i think it was for the 100th anniversary we decided to, to you know get to have it painted and the company was in staten island i think and the woman who did it was incredible but as she started to peel things away there was so much destruction to it some some things that she found were broken and glued back so she had to redo a lot of it and uh, you know and and the ladies the ladies put the money together and paid for it in, in full and uh, it came back I think beautiful and probably originally from Italy or uh, I that I don't know right. I don't know I believe it's Michael's. Oh, the florist. The florist. The florist. Right. Thanks, Roseanne. Thanks, Roseanne. <laughs> Next time I come on this, Roseanne, you're coming with me. <laughs> okay. And uh, this is what most people know is the outdoor activities right. from the feast. And uh, that's right on the corner of 7th and Jefferson. So that picture is taken from the Zapla booth. Right. Um, so that's where the Zapla booth would be. And there's the ladies working the Zapla booth. Uh, they, they've advanced over the years. They used to be like a trough of hot oil uh, on, on a, a burner. And we've gotten a little safer now. So we have uh, actual deep fryers. They're, they're, I think, five or six. I think one, two. I think there's five deep fryers uh, that... Now, Buddy, the cake boss, helped us uh, look at some. He gave us some suggestions years ago right. with that. And um, it's it's safer, <laughs> it's better, and uh, then, but how those ladies did it years and years ago and the, these hot oil troughs is amazing. Right. I mean, you would get burned just yep. <laughs> walking by. Yeah. So Thanks, Eric. I can only imagine. Yeah. See you at the feast, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and the, but that the Zaplas are the key thing. Mm -hmm. And here are some of the, the young girls who work in the Zapla booth. The uh, over the years we've needed help, and so we we have hired a number of young people that live in the area, and uh, they help us out marvelously. And so. Uh, these are three young women that work, and they're fast. These girls are fast, you know, getting the zaplas out on the on the, the counter. Um, they also, these girls can actually make the need the dough. They could do almost everything. So you have a couple of girls, uh, no, no, not a couple, a number of girls, and a couple of guys. These two guys uh, are that's Felix, and that the one in the back is Ramon. These two guys have been with us for a long time. 
the the man in front, his father, is like he, he's he's the the head of the, uh, the fixing things, setting the bar up, fixing the bar, fixing any kind of leaks, and his son has jumped in and helped out because two years ago Felix, who was who was his father, uh, got sick, and these two guys, Ramon and Felix, can they could take care of all the maintenance of the of the feast. There's there's a they need stuff to come up. They need hot oil. There's a leak. There's a sometimes the water could leak into the hot oil, and that it will make it overflow. These two guys are the ones who jump in and uh, you know, shut it down, clean out the oil, put new oil in. Uh, these guys are there. All these people, young girls and guys, they're there before we start, and they're there an hour to two hours after it's it closes at night. And they do the garbage. They do, they do, they do a lot of work. Right. So we are so grateful for so many of them. Right. And they'll be glad to be back. Yes. Right? Yes. And, uh, and this year, of course, anybody working there has to be vaccinated. Sure. So a lot of young people are not vaccinated. I just found out that the young ones we need all got vaccinated. Okay. So, so there okay. is uh, inspiration. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, we didn't really talk. I'm, I'm thinking about the areas. So uh, the church went, got a lot of damage during Sandy, uh, but there yes. was sort of a silver lining to that story too, I think. Well, it was, we were in a slow process of trying to fix up some, some leaks and things like this. Um, when we have the 50-50 raffle every year at the feast, the money that the church gets goes to the renovation of anything in the church. When Hurricane Sandy hit, I was out of there. I was no longer pastor there. Father Remo came in, and uh, the basement got terrible damage. As you know, anything that got hit with water or any kind of flooding, everything had to get thrown out. All those burners stored in the basement, they all had to get thrown out. And... Um, it gave us an opportunity to because now the heating and electrical system were in the basement. Now we had to put them two stories up. And so that was the first beginning of a project to move that stuff uh, two stories up. And they put it out in the parking lot. And they started with the renovation. They, they had to dig the parking lot up. They had to re-put foundations in the parking lot. They had to redo the basement. And then... And Father Remo said, well, let's do what we can do. And probably about two or three, about two years later, so Hurricane hit San Sandy hit in 2012. I'm going to say it was 2015, 14 or 15, when uh, they started a uh, restoration. And so it wasn't renovation, it's restoration. I think to the benefit of many of the parishioners, they saw that the church was beautiful, but it needed work. And so they put a lot of money into it, fixing the roof, fixing all the leaks, fixing the walls, uh, and no changes to the church except cleaning it up. And so it was restored, and uh, the people people put money into it, and they put a lot of work into it and time. And uh, we have, I think, <laughs> I'm, I'm prejudiced here. Uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful churches I've seen. You know, and, uh, it is beautiful. Um, and I mean, like what you said, the cleaning was amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they must have taken yeah. everything out and just yeah. polished and polished and, you and, know, and we did scraped like and scraped. Some of the, the mosaics there were black, mm -hmm. you know, just dirt over sure. the years. Yeah. And they cleaned them all trying to keep everything the way it was so right. that's and putting a, a new a good shot to yeah, back that up putting a new uh lighting system in keeping the same fixtures just changing the 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 wiring and the lighting um put new lights in the back to bring out some of the beauty of the back altar there right um how high did the water get i say just we're talking about that today eric i think the water got three to four feet I think that's what it was. So the basements would fill up yeah. first, right? Connie. Connie, in, indeed one of the most beautiful churches. And Connie <laughs> was a parishioner. She's now moved down to Virginia. So 
So we'll she keep, keeps in touch with us. Right. Will Connie come back for this year's feast? Uh, I, I would, I would put money on it. <laughs> um, okay. I thought she might reply back. Um, so just go back to that one previous slide, Rand. Sorry. Um, so this is the inside of church. I mean, it's, it is so the m materials, the marble, uh, yeah. the surfaces are just impeccable. And I've never seen, I've lived in Hoboken. Yes, Connie, <laughs> we'll be back. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> see you on, see you on seventh and Jefferson. Um, but I've never seen the church look this good, you know, in 40 yeah. years. And I tell people you could eat off the floor. I know yeah. that sounds a little weird, but it's, well, and it's so it's, clean. Yes. It's and amazing. I, I have to give the credit to one woman, hmm. Maria, who's been cleaning there for 15 years. She does everything wow. herself. Really? She does the whole church a couple wow. of times a week. She cleans the rectory, She the, the friary, you know, um, she cleans the offices. She clean, takes care of the basement. She does all the ironing. Um, does it all herself. I don't know how she does it. I don't Because either. it's it's a lot of work. No, it's a lot of square footage um, on there. I can remember going by the church, and I think they built a ramp for the steps, and yes. they were moving in a scissor lift to get up, you know, <laughs> and I just, or it was coming out. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But the, just something about a scissor lift going into the church just seemed, you know, very opposite. But they had to get up to yes. the ceiling. Do you know how yeah. high the ceilings are? I don't. Um, I'm going to say, just by the sizes, uh, I, I'm going to probably say 30, 30 to 40 feet. Yeah, well, think. the top part of the ceiling is right. probably higher than that. Yeah, but, sure. Um, and so you're in pretty good shape. Yes, yes. We thank God everything is in is fine. It's uh, it's it's in good shape, and uh, the people <laughs> the people just keep it that way. The people uh, do what they can. During COVID, we had to sanitize the church at right. every mass. Oh man, we would just say, "Could anybody want to stay?" And so many people just get a, a disinfectant wipe and start wiping down pews. And, right. Uh, to the point where they will bring their own disinfectant wipes in. Because that's a lot of disinfectant, yeah. right? <laughs> Didn't even think about that. And so how is the church set up during the feast? Like people are welcome to come in. What would they expect? Uh, well, the novena, the nine nights of the novena, uh, which we have mass every night at 7 o'clock. So the church would be open. I'm going to say 6 o'clock. Then when the feast starts, the church is open the whole time. So it will be open all night, you know, till midnight, 11 o'clock. And then uh, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday this year, because that's when the Feast of St. Anne is, the church is open all day long, you know. And so people come in. Um Usually Father Charlie is sitting in the church there, available for confession if anybody wants to come in. And people during the feast, even though there's stuff going out on the streets, during the feast, people go into that church. They get candles, they, you know, and the Holy Name does a lot of work with that and setting up the candles. And, you know, now <laughs> we can't have flame candles anymore because of fire hazards. So it's electrical. But in the past, uh, you know, when you have, and now they could they could buy candles and bring them home, uh, but in, in the past they would they would sell two, three, four thousand candles uh, during the during the feast. So, and people still come and they'll light the candles because they they have racks now of electrical candles. Uh, it's just not the same, you know. Just the right. smell is not the same. Sure. But well, I understand the the fire hazard that can be there. And that's probably where Joe Sebo hangs out. Oh yes, oh yeah, he's in there the, the whole time, and Joe Tulio and, and so course. many Patty Pasquale, yeah. mm -hmm. who's president of the Holy Name. And the Holy Name does a lot of that. You know, it takes care of the, the inside part of the church during the feast. Right, right. Um, they have uh, people can buy religious articles too, and they sell that in there too. And it's air conditioned. It's air conditioned. <laughs> An extra benefit. Yes. On there. On there. Okay. Um, 
and another another example See, of the now, procession. The men are carrying the saint at this point because it just came out. So they'll set it up, and then that's Paddy Pasculi right there with his back to us, and he uh, he he organizes these guys, and right. uh, so they set it up, and then the women take over. Right. I recognize Richard Del Baccio. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and and so this is setting the up the women. Yep. And, the and the women have sashes and they wear white. And that's how you know them. And so, uh, you know, at the, at the, at the day of the, the feast. Right, right. And this is probably the old tradition of carrying? This would be before 2012. Right. And they they got it on their shoulders, it's the little pillows on the shoulders to kind of help. Right. But uh, it's heavy. It is. It, it's heavy. I, I don't know the weight of that statue, but I think, I think somebody told me once it's about 600 pounds. Okay. Sure. And those are steep steps. Yes. Yes, they are. And I think that's why the men take it down. They have a little more control over it. Right. And once it's down on the street, there they are. That's right. And is there a route that there is? Is that and, like based and that's, on where parishioners live or Yes, and that's that route has changed too. Because, you know, the in the past the parishioners lived the further out. Uh and so that tradition apparently this would be for me and the feast of Saint Anne was almost like a holiday, you know, and so that's why you always had a lot of people, uh, you know, in the streets there because it was it was like a holiday. Uh, people would have dinners and uh, all, all kinds of, of celebrations, and the the saint would come down and would stop at certain places if if you asked the saint, you know, them to stop at that house. Uh, still does that. But they don't go as far as they used to. Um, there are a number of places where <laughs> they're, they're rest routes, they're rest stops. Mm -hmm. So Joe Trulio's Butcher Shop, that was one. And they would bring out pizza. Uh, Fiella's Funeral Home, that's another one. And, and the San Giacomo Club is another one. Where, and they would bring out food and drinks for everybody. And they'd stop for about 10, 15 minutes. Right. And everybody get a little something to eat and move, move sure. along. Sure, fuel up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. definitely. Um, and, of course, won't be stopping at Trulio's. No. That's a so I don't know if they're going to go that, that far up. They might. I don't know. Right. Um, and the police lead it. And so that it's what's a wonderful thing where the whole town is involved. You know, the police are involved. The first aid squad is always there, you know. Um, but the police, uh, they have the route mapped out. Sure, sure. So I think we're kind of winding down. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, present or discuss? I can't think of anything more except we just invite as many people out as we can. Uh, come out just for fun. Come out just to, just to meet with people and say hello to people and to come out and maybe come into the church and just say a prayer, take a moment. Uh, if you are a woman looking, wanting to have a child to get pregnant, stop in St. Anne, talk to her, tell her you need help, and uh, let the tradition continue. It's so important in our culture today for certain types of traditions. And I would say that, you know, under Sandy, we all kind of got a little insular, yeah. and uh, I think it's time to get yeah. out there a little more. And, and, the, so, and the COVID has locked people in. So right. Mentally and yes. physically. Yes. So I think I'm, I'm really happy that you, uh, the city encouraged you to yes. continue this this year, and the I timing is right. I am too. And uh, it may not be exactly like the past, but we got to start mm -hmm. to stumble back for sure. Well, and that's the thing is... Again, it's a tradition. You had a bleep last year, and the tradition continues. You know, <laughs> baseball is a tradition. They went through it last year, and it's back again. And it's that kind of thing. It's it's part of our culture. It's part of our life. And you know, people, young people who have who weren't here last year, who came in last year, are excited about it. 
because they've never seen it. And and now that they want to be part of it, a uh, number of them have volunteered just because they hear so much about it. So I think you're also going to get a lot of, you know, I mean, St. Anne's always had people who had roots in Hoboken moved mm -hmm. away, but would come back for yes. that. And I think a lot of those people are really going to yes. come back. Yes, we hope so. Wanna we hope we want connect to, again. We want to see the old friends again. Yeah. Connie's good. coming back. Okay, Connie. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much. This oh, was wow. a lot thank of fun. Thank you so much. I and enjoyed we're it. just going to make a few comments and wrap things up here. Uh, we, we had a great conversation uh, with Father Vinny. I want to mention that next week, uh, Valerie Huffnagel will be interviewed by uh, Terry Francis. And, and Valerie is, uh, has been a board member, board president, uh, has a very important business in town and should be a good interview. And then the following week, I'll be interviewing performer Ron Albanese. And uh, we do want to thank some of our supporters of the museum. And uh, Donald Jackett was uh, someone who uh, loved Hoboken, uh, came here in the 70s and really you know, rose to make Hoboken an exciting place with all his ideas uh, and uh, did include us in his estate planning. So we thank him mm. for that. It's important. And uh, also uh, New Jersey Historical Commission, which is our main government supporter. And uh, they help us in so many ways. And we recently received a grant to upgrade our microphones uh, our lighting, uh, and we don't have more space, but uh, they did uh, help us a lot. So we thank them. And then Applied Development Company, uh, you know, one of the uh, stalwarts in Hoboken, mover and shaker, and has definitely been a big supporter of the museum in many, many ways. And Roseanne Versace, thank you, Bob and Father Vinny. And thank you, Roseanne, for kind of getting the ball go going. Oh, Connie's pushing raffle tickets. I yes, love don't it. forget the raffle so tickets 50, now. So 50 is... Yeah, they're doing a little differently this year. It's okay. $10 for a ticket, for one ticket. So it means less tickets, but more of a chance of winning. Okay, okay. Thank you, Connie, for that. You score points. <laughs> Does she get a free ticket? No. <laughs> no, she wouldn't take a free ticket. She wouldn't, yes. She would, she would I understand pay. that. Okay, so we're signing out of Hoboken Talks. And uh, we do also mention that actually the museum is closed for visitation because we're putting up a new exhibit. And that's pretty exciting for us. Uh, we open August 1st, and the theme of the exhibit, it's called The Avenue, and it's a history of Washington Street. Uh, Washington Street is also another great tradition in Hoboken. Mm. So we really hope you come check that exhibit up August 1st. And then in our upper gallery, we'll be featuring uh, the paintings of Donna O'Grady, longtime artist in Hoboken, beautiful night scene shot here. And that also opens August 1st. And again, a lot of our other programs are still happening. And uh, here's Rand Hoppe and his wife, Lisa, playing ping pong. And Eric Kamer is thanking us for the great show and the great hat. Yeah, I'm covering up my bad, bad hair or lack of a haircut. But uh, come up to the museum walkway, hang out, chill, uh, and play some ping pong. So we got a lot of things going on and trying to keep the spirit going in Hoboken. Great. Thank you so much. Signing off just about now.